listening to the Becoming Who You Are podcast, your guide to authentic living. Visit becomingwhoyouare.net for more resources, tools, and suggestions designed to help you create the life you want from the inside out. Now here's your host, Hannah. So hi, everybody, and welcome to this Psychology Book Club, where we're talking about In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts by Gabor Mate. Okay, so... First of all, what did you what did you all think of the book? And when I say you all, I mean Jake and David <laughs> <laughs> and myself. Um, yeah, what, what, what I mean, I have a number of thoughts of my own, but I'd be really interested to hear what you guys thought as well. Jake, do you mind uh, giving me? You know, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Sure. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed this book. Uh, I found it a very, very readable book. I was um, pleasantly surprised because I thought that it would be um, by Dr. Bat- uh, Gabor Mate. I thought it'd be quite an academic book, but it's actually a really um, very humane and very sort of uh, yeah human book um, because he focuses a lot on uh, stories of his own experience about dealing with um, people uh, who are who have uh, addictions, and he talks about stories of his life as a doctor um, in uh, dealing with um, well, basically drug addicts in uh, is it Vancouver? I yeah. think so. That was a nice uh, surprise. It was I thought it was going to be a, a sort of really dusty academic tome, but it was actually um, a very humane book and a very sad book. Um, I did find a lot of the stories to be really um, just heartbreaking. Um, and I have to say, I, I think he makes a few very, very good points uh, clearly. And he sort of reinforces them with a lot of stories. Um, they were, they weren't, uh, there wasn't that much in this book beyond those major points, if you see what I mean. I think it was pretty much what I got from the book. Um, and the, the points that he wanted to make is that um, the key thing that he's talked about is how addiction in all of his patients um, is directly related to childhood trauma. And so he is making the point in this book that you just cannot ignore the fact that all of the patients who come to see him had horrific childhood traumas. I mean, we're talking about... Uh, sexual abuse, uh, extreme physical abuse, extreme neglect. And he goes through and sort of explains the life story of, of many of the people who are suffering from addiction. So that's one of the key points that he makes is that, that there's a really strong relationship between childhood trauma and uh, and addiction. And he, he makes that point and goes on to sort of contrast that with um, people who think addiction is genetic. And the other key point that he made um, is that there is really a spectrum of addiction and that addiction, when you think about someone injecting heroin as being addictive behaviour, he, I think, very persuasively makes the point that there's, uh, well, there are, there are chemical um, sort of uh, drug-based addictions, there are also behavioural addictions, and there's a spectrum, and essentially everyone can get some of these sort of beha- um, mm-hmm. addictive behaviours going as a result of trauma. And he talks quite a lot about his own experience and because uh, he um, compulsively buys music and he talks about how that is actually a, um, a kind of an addictive um, thing. Now, it's a little bit of a... It's a while since I read the book, so I would also be really keen to see if like, I've completely missed out on a lot more deeper stuff that I got from it. But those were the two really fundamental ideas that that I took from it. And in terms of its sort of um, relevance for me, you know, I did find it very, very interesting to then say, okay, well, let's look at myself and what are my own addictive behaviours and where do I sort of fit on the spectrum? And he talks, for example, about um, workaholism and I I definitely have been through stages of that in my life, not now, uh, but in the past. And he also talks about... um, uh, yeah, different different other ways that the, that you can sort of look at your own behaviour, and and uh, I found that um, that really helpful um, and interesting and relevant. Um, so that's sort of the quick overview of what I got from it. Yeah, I think that's a great introduction to the book, and um, I I had a similar experience. I I found 
I definitely prefer the anecdotal um, sections of the book to the more <clears throat> um, biology heavy sections. I preferred the sections that were specifically about people that he had worked with or about his opinions to do with social policy and things that were influencing the way that addicts experience their treatment. Um, I, I also, I, one of the things that I appreciated most, I think, was his humility um, and his willingness to talk about his own ego and his own, um, like you were saying, Jake, his own struggles with his addiction to classical music. And one of the things that I really appreciated about it is that it really helped illuminate just how um, subtle and in some ways subversive addictions can be because if you if you just heard him say oh i have an addiction to classical music it almost sounds like a joke but when he went into more detail and talked about how you know he would go out and spend hundreds of dollars at a time um i, I can't remember if it was ever thousands of dollars i think he said over the course of a couple of weeks, once he managed to spend thousands of dollars on classical music, that he'd never listened to most of the CDs, that he had ended up lying to his wife about it and hiding it from her. And it really helped me see just how much addictions don't only affect, it's not just about the immediate behavior that that person is engaging in, but how it filters through into other elements of their life as well and, and really affects people around them. And I also really appreciated the account that he included, um, the letter that his son wrote him about how his addiction to classical music had affected him. Yeah, and, and to work. To yeah, and to work. work as well. And I thought that was incredibly honest and in, incredibly humble of him. And I think because he took that approach, it made me a lot more willing to look at, um, at the way that addiction has manifested in my life as well and take it a lot, take some of my previous behaviors a lot more seriously and look at them with a lot more um, willingness to explore them than I think I might have otherwise. I might have just been tempted to kind of dismiss them and say, oh, well, that's not really an addiction because it didn't involve drugs or whatever. Mm. Um, but the fact that he, he kind of highlighted his own experience with that and said, no, if it gets to the point where um, the way that he defines addiction is if it gets to the point where it's, it's a compulsion to the point where it's affecting the people around you and other areas of your life and you're prioritizing that particular behavior or that particular thing and obtaining that thing or engaging in that thing over the people around you um, and other things in your life, then that's an addiction. Mm. And that, it really made me think about... Um, my personal experience with that. So I, I really like that. And I just, I really appreciated the deeper understanding that it gave me of addiction in general, um, because there is a lot of debate, I think, in society about whether addiction is a choice or whether it's a disease. And I really appreciated his position, which was that it's, it's somewhere in the middle, because addiction does irrevocably change your brain. Um, or maybe not irrevocably, but it does change the uh, physical makeup of your brain. But you can take steps to control that. And I, I really, um, I got a lot out of reading the four steps that he mentioned towards doing that. So, yeah, Dave, I'd be interested to hear what you thought as well. Thank you. Yes, I, um, not to make it all about me, but I, I felt very fortunate in the way I was introduced to the book was through a lecture that uh, Dr. Mate gave on it was and it was covered by C-SPAN at the book during the book's release he was doing his press tour and I'm not sure what um, prompted me to click on the link but it was a uh, about an hour and a half lecture on the book uh, reading excerpts talking about his work and then a question and answer period and it, it to me uh, what I immediately got from just watching and listening to him, and I wanted to thank you for mentioning it, is uh, his empathy and his humility. He comes across, uh, I think genuinely, as a, as a uh, person who cares very deeply about his uh, f uh, fellow man. And also, uh, I guess his decades of experience dealing with, you know, really the, the darkest aspects of chemical addictions is his re his uh, realism about the effects and the the um the chances of people uh, sort of escaping the cycle no, he's not pessimistic but he's to me was very realistic about summing up the the challenges that people face 
so I, I read the book and was really quite moved uh, by it. One of the first things that really caught my eye was his debunking of the notion of uh, chemical addictions, uh, of people being addicted to drugs through the chemical route. In other words, they are, their bodies become it becomes necessary to that to the body to to take it in yeah. and his mentioning of heroin uh, the rates of heroin usage among uh vietnam uh, uh military personnel both before uh, like while they were stationed there and then after the war i think it was some staggering reduction it was like less than 1% or between 1 to 3% i think continued to uh use it whereas when they were in Vietnam, they were using it quite regularly, at least weekly, if not uh, more often. So that amount of usage would predict, you know, a massive um, addiction problem when they got back, but they just stopped using it. So um, I, that to me really struck home. Also his chapters on the importance of uh, prenatal or uh, prenatal and, and uh, maternal care while the child is in the womb and during infancy and the anecdote that he brought up of when he was an, a child or, or actually an infant and i'm sorry i can't remember the the town but i believe it was in he grew up in poland it may have been warsaw but i think it was uh, um budapest and hungary yes excuse me oh i'm so sorry i, I, I could not have been more <laughs> <It's all right. laughs> and his the anecdote was that uh he was colicky and crying and his mother couldn't soothe him uh and so his mother called uh, the physician's office to say, I'd like to bring my baby in. And the woman said, that's fine. We can schedule an appointment for you, but just please be aware that all of our Jewish patients, uh, children are crying right now. And it was because of the, I believe because of the either impending invasion of the Nazis or they had already started to occupy uh, that area of the world. And so the stress that the parents were feeling was going right through into the children who were anxious and, and upset also. Um, that, that to mm -hmm. me was a really powerful anecdote that, that, uh, that hit home. I also, I really, uh, I found that section so insightful, not only because it really emphasized how attuned children are to their parents and how attuned parents are parents need to be to their children in order to fulfill their needs and i really like the fact that he made the point that people who are addicts you nine times out of ten if not more statistically it's because of emotional needs not being met in their childhood but it, I like the fact that he made the point that children don't have to be abused in order for that to be the case. It doesn't have to be outright abuse. It can just be a case that their parents were very loving. Um, materially, they had everything provided for them, but they, they just weren't attuned to their child's needs. They weren't mentally and emotionally present um, and able to connect with and empathize their child to the level that the child needed them to. And how that just that in itself can be a basis for... Um, uh, I don't really like this phrase, but uh, an addictive personality, so to speak, later on. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so he sp speaks m uh, in this lecture uh, about attunement, and I think he brings it up many times in the book as well, um, and how hard it is for the adult who is struggling with addiction to sort of step outside and see I think he says it's it's hard to miss something that you've never had. It's very hard mm -hmm. for that person mm -hmm. to understand the hole that's in their life when it, the the absence of attunement, the absence of mirroring, or uh, the kind of nurturing that a child needs is uh, is is present. Uh, I I know it sounds silly to say that that something is present when it's absent, but it's that hole that people then turn to drugs and alcohol and risky behavior and compulsive behavior to, to try to fulfill it. Yeah, absolutely. Without even really being, well, without being at all conscious of the fact that that was what was missing in the first place. And I, I mean, one of the things that really struck me is that there was, and I know it's kind of over now, but there was definitely a phase in psychology when people were exploring whether this was genetic and whether addiction it's like alcoholism and gambling where people were genetically dis disposed towards these things. And I guess it's kind of easy to see why they might have thought that when you think about the cycle that goes 
on with um, people who turn to addictions to fulfill their needs because if you have a parent who themselves did not receive the attunement that they needed in childhood and developed addictions as a way of coping with that, whatever those, however those addictions manifested later on in life, then because they are using those um, addictions to cope with the world and to process their feelings or try to, um, they're not going to be able to be mentally present and attuned to their child. And so the, the process gets passed on and on. Another thing that I, I really appreciated about his own story was, um, I guess, the kind of mental puzzle that he started putting together to do with his own experiences when he was talking to another psychiatrist whose name I've completely forgotten now. <clears throat> and the psychiatrist said, it was he was talking about his music addiction and the psychiatrist suggested or the psychologist suggested that that might be due to the fact that when he was a child when he felt abandoned it was the noises around him that helped him feel um, less abandoned and more comfortable and helped soothe him and perhaps now that's why music in particular rather than smoking or gambling or sex or um, you know, alcohol or drugs or anything is his addiction of choice. And I thought that was really fascinating because from the sound of it, he that's, that's the way things were for him. And um, I found that element of it really interesting, the, the question of why do some people, why do people turn to the addictions that they turn to? Why do some people become dependent on drugs and other people on alcohol? Um, other people have a lot more socially acceptable addictions like workaholism. Um, other people... Uh, develop compulsive behaviors like OCD or eating disorders or they become obsessed with exercising you know it's really I found that question really really fascinating yes I, I think he does mention too uh, if not in the book in later interviews that there are that he acknowledges the secondary gains to that that particular addiction uh, I think he mentioned in the book that uh, it was with great shame that he acknowledged to himself, I don't think he told anyone else in the moment, but perhaps he did, that he was literally pushing off patients, like he should have been in the hospital getting ready, I think either for a, an operation or, or, or you know, something. He wasn't putting anyone at risk, but at the same time, he was out, you know, at Tower Records or something. And the fact uh, that he was doing that um, brought him great shame later, and it was that that shame management that seemed to be a part of the addiction as well. Because he, just just like a an alcoholic, you know, the the stereotype is hiding bottles around the house. He would hide his latest purchases if he had duplicates of a particular recording. He would hide those. He would disguise them as oh, you know, I've already I've had those for years. I think he said he he kept them in the trunk of his car. I mean, it was just classic, you know, begging to be caught uh, kind of behavior. Um, so I, I completely agree with that, that psychiatrist making that observation, but there were, all, there were also secondary gains to that, that kind of addiction. And who can, uh, on the surface, def, um, get upset? Of, of course, the money is an issue, but perhaps not to someone doing very well in the medical field, but who could take issue with, you know, simply shopping for music, it seems mm -hmm. like on the surface, an innocuous um, pastime. He also mentioned his own, he, he's very upfront, I think, about um, not f uh, fame, but recognition for yes. what it is he does. And that it, uh, it kills him when, um, you know, as someone else might be recognized for their body of work in medicine. And he finds that a constant source of, you know, he's, it's an area he's working on actively to try to figure that out. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, just going back to the point you were making about the music, at the end of the book, when he's talking about his own, um, his own attempts to reconcile himself with his addiction, um, and that's something that I want to come back to you later, because his approach to... Um, managing addiction rather than curing it I thought was really really interesting but when interestingly enough when he talks about his own experience with that I don't know if you remember this but he mentions that when he started being upfront with his wife about his purchases he found it a lot easier to not buy stuff and um, that kind of urgency and desire to 
and recklessness. Um, I think the in the book the uh, the anecdote that he relates is that someone a patient of his was actually giving birth, and he missed the birth because he was in um, his local record store browsing music, and he hadn't intended to do that. It had just played out that way and he just got really caught up in buying music and listening to music and everything and he ended up missing the birth of his patient um but yeah as, as soon as he started talking to his wife about all the purchases that he had made and actually being very upfront with her about it um and dealing with the consequences of that um he seemed to find it a lot easier to rein it in and not let the to be able to control the behavior rather than the behavior controlling him so I thought I thought that was very interesting, and I guess it goes back to what you were saying, Dave, about how part part of the secondary gain with addictions is this fear of is is the the cycle of being caught out as well. It's not just the high, it's not just the pursuit and then the high. It's the the being caught out as well. It rem, it actually um, reminds me of a quote that someone he went to interview an author called Stephen Reed for the book, um, and this this author was in prison for. I think bank robbery, but I'm not sure. But anyway, he was a he was a drug addict, and it reminded me of this quote that I I highlighted, which is um, there is something reassuring about bottoming out, says Stephen Reed Riley, a sense that you can't fall any further. And what he's talking about is a sense of relief that when you do finally hit rock bottom, it's like okay, this can't get any worse. And actually, there's something very comforting about that. And that's he suggests that that's why so people go through that cycle again and again and again because although rock bottom is a really shit place to be at least you can't go any further down whereas when things are going well I guess for them there's a sense of like oh you know when when is this gonna go wrong mm. right yeah and there there was also the in terms of hitting rock bottom I've it's been I don't, perhaps you tell me your thoughts on this. Uh, it's been my experience that in, in dealing with my own addictions and talking with other people, that there is a, there is a rock bottom, that that line is different for everyone. So yeah. the, the person who uses uh, marijuana, for example, might say something like, oh, sure, I get high, but I would never, you know, snort cocaine or, or, inject something and then the cocaine user says well sure i snort this but i would never inject it or i would never do heroin and there's that line of it's almost like the, it, they see it as a dignity thing like if i fall below this line and i start doing this then i then there's i would have to acknowledge consciously that there's something very wrong with what i'm doing mm. um and that I found that to be very true, and it certainly within myself, and also with other people. That that line below which people refuse to um, sink, it, it's there's a lot to be found when you think about wh why that is. Like, why is this particular behavior okay, but then if it magnifies to this point, suddenly so, you know there's something um, wrong with it or unhealthy. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to say, I think it, what's interesting about the book as well, though, is that he really brings out the difference between socially approved addictions and socially frowned upon addictions. And I think maybe the rock bottom thing, you know, like with things like workaholism or like some of the ones that are, uh, and like he talks about it in terms of his job and so forth. I guess the difference there is that people often get positive feedback for, for, being Especially addicted. when you're something like a physician or a doctor right. and you're helping the community. Yeah. And that's like the opposite to somebody who's getting more and more addicted to, um, to uh, uh, like drugs or whatever. So I wonder how that works with, with the, um, you know, in a sense with people who, are, uh, who have chosen a socially uh, acceptable addiction, they get reinforced rather than sort of ostracized mm. and that must have an effect on whether or not you ever get to rock bottom i mean i'm sure there's a lot of surgeons who work their entire lives barely seeing their families and and uh and like get to the end and nobody in a sense looks down upon them for for the for their addictive um tendencies in terms of the way that they approach work you know yeah i think that's an interesting point he also does say at the end of the book that evidence shows that when 
people are punished for their addictions and when they're treated with derision and in a very punitive way that it actually makes their addictions worse mm. and he gives the example of all these um programs that were set up there was one in vancouver and there was also i think one in the uk for a while in merseyside um where people could go and get safely injected with heroin and they really you know most of the people on that program really cleaned up their lives some of them i think even got jobs and were functioning as really productive even though they were still addicted to heroin they were functioning as really productive members of society and he was making the point that it's not the drugs themselves that cause the social problems that we associate with drug addiction it's the way that people who are addicted to drugs are treated by society and punished by society and outcast by society that's yeah. that's you know he made the point that drugs themselves don't cause crime it's not, you know, things like heroin are actually, uh, they have a sedative effect and they actually make people a lot calmer. Um, I think things like cocaine and um, crystal meth can occasionally make people violent, but overall, drugs don't have that effect. What makes, what causes um, drug addicts to become violent is the desperation because drugs are illegal, so they have an inflated cost, and so people need more money to go and get them, but because drug addiction is so frowned upon, most of them don't have jobs or homes, and so they turn to things like prostitution, and it just, it, and theft as well, and it just, this whole vicious cycle of punishment for them um, just carries on and on and gets worse and worse and worse. And I, I thought that was so interesting because, I mean, it definitely jived with my, my personal view that I've had for a long time, which is that drugs should be legalised. And if they were legalised, then, you know, if people were allowed to um, take them, then the world would be a much safer place for them and for other people who might, uh, you know, have otherwise fallen victim to drug-related crime. Absolutely, absolutely. And he shows how... Um completely arbitrary it is that some drugs are considered uh, acceptable and legal alcohol which has like far more damaging and, and tobacco which yeah, causes the most deaths out of any drug compared to other drugs and he gives interesting examples of people who have been like highly productive um i can't remember who it was like a 19th century it surgeon. Was surgeon it was a surgeon who was the first person that suggested people should wear wash their hands gloves or when wash, they wear were gloves right and he was yeah and he was a like basically a, uh, an opium addict for years. I wanted to just go back to another point that you guys were talking about earlier on about attunement, because um, he he made a point that I really uh, thought was really uh, in, insightful about um, parents, because he he does talk about the impact of uh, childhood trauma, and uh, like you guys were talking about earlier, the, the people who who get addicted to things are addicted um, because they're looking for something they didn't get in childhood and didn't they didn't develop the sort of self-soothing skills and all of that mm. kind of stuff and he makes the point in this when he talks about that difference between uh, loving parenting and attunement in parenting he makes the point that if you talk to a parent often what you'll find is that if you ask them about their parenting they will recall in their own minds uh, intense feelings of love for their children like so from their own perspective they you say like you try and talk to them about what's happening with their kid uh, for example if their kids um, got involved in, in an addiction they recall in their own minds their own thoughts about oh I, I love my child and the point being is that th there is their own perception of feelings of love towards their child is not the same thing as whether they were an adequate or nurturing parent and whether they were attuned to the child's needs. So that you get this mismatch between parents who remember being very loving parents because they remembered having feelings of love, but they could be completely neglectful, they could be very abusive, they could be other things because the fact is that it doesn't matter whether you fundamentally whether you feel like you love your child is not what counts what counts is what the child gets and, and whether or not the child gets attunement and connection um, with the parent and I thought that was really uh, a very uh, sort of insightful thing that he pointed out there because he, he's aware of what it is from the parents perspective and how the parents sort of missed 
the whole point in a way, but can still imagine that they had a connection when the connection mm. wasn't there. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, this is complete um, speculation, but, you know, if you go back a generation, perhaps you would see also that they had the same um, experience of their parents. Oh, yeah, totally. And that it's a cycle repeating itself. And that's the sad thing about all of his patients is that they were yeah, drug they addicts the and their kids think, and then those kids turn uh, into his patients yeah. you know and he has like two or three generations of people that he's seeing in, 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 in the book he talks about yeah there's another thing I just wanted to point out which I thought was a, a really fascinating quote and you were talking Hannah earlier about this question of whether or not um, uh, addiction is a choice or um a disease and basically the way that he puts it because he he does talk about how once you become addicted it doesn't mess with your brain or, or it's not that the becoming addicted is it's, it's part of your, your whole lack of childhood care and nurturing that there are physical changes in the brain and the addiction is sort of compounding that but he makes a really he, there's a really good quote he said in there where he says the road to hell is not paved with good intentions it's paved with lack of intention. And he said that when he's talking about how in order to get out of addiction, you have to have these like small habit changes every single day and you have to be really uh, dedicated to changing your behavior, I guess. And it, it's so... And, and essentially the, the thing that he really focuses on is mindfulness and consciousness of, of what's going on for you, your feelings and everything else, and having, like, a really clear idea of what's happening because he contrasts that with the experience of, of his patients, which is a lot of the time it's really unconscious, the addictive behaviour. It's just feel an urge and then react. Mm. And he's talking about how you have to, like, catch that moment. Slow time. Right, slow time down so you can actually have an intention between feeling the urge and reacting. You can intend to either do something or not do something and not just be sort of uh, determined by your history but actually, you know, in a way sort of flex the muscle of free will that you have to really exercise in order to, in order to have any intention. I thought that was really interesting. That's definitely been my experience with addiction. I mean, it really made me think about smoking, um, and eating as well, because I know, like, I, I I used to joke that I'm really good at quitting smoking, because I've done it four times now. <laughs> and um, I, you know, I don't, I definitely am at a point in my life, well, my adult life anyway, since I first started smoking, where I feel um, the least like smoking that I've ever felt. I mean, it's been nearly two years since I quit last time. But it's still something that I know if I wasn't really aware of, I could quite easily slip back into it, even though I know it's really bad for me. I know that it affects other things that I enjoy doing in my life and it would have a direct negative impact on other things that I really enjoy doing in my life right now. Um, and it would probably eventually stop me from doing those things. I know all that, but I, it's something that I feel like I have to be really aware of. Mm. Um, another, another thing is also eating out of boredom or eating when I'm stressed, mm. um, just like grazing. And not because I'm hungry, just because I'm bored or I'm stressed. And again, it's something that if I was just not thinking about it, I would do an autopilot. Mm. And I wouldn't even really be, it'd be like an involuntary reaction. I wouldn't even really be aware of what I was doing. So it's definitely been my experience that if I, when I've tried to change those things, it's almost like I have to kind of slow time down matrix style mm. and just remove myself kind of, the best way to describe this kind of intellectually or emotionally remove myself from the situation and almost look at myself from the outside and observe myself and observe what's happening for me um, and that's the only thing that really works because if you if you take the normal approach which is to just go cold turkey and say no I'm not going to do this it's bad you know it's um I guess what most people advocate for addictions which is just giving up completely um you then get stuck in the cycle where you start obsessing about it even more and it just gets worse and worse and worse. So I've definitely found the mindful approach the most effective. Yeah, it's the the iron will of discipline uh, is BS. I mean, it, to, uh, 
I'm sure there are people out there who have successfully, I mean, I know there are people who have successfully quit it, quit an addiction through that cold turkey. I'm just going to, you know, be a steel-willed, um, relentlessly vigilant human being. And over time, they, they overcome that addiction. But inevitably, anyway, my observation has been that inevitably it, it just pops up somewhere else in, yeah. in some other form. So it's either compulsive exercising or if someone's giving up smoking, they start to overeat mm -hmm. or um, I've even seen like religious convictions suddenly, you know, completely consume the person. Mm -hmm. So it's when, yeah, it's when you can step outside the cycle, however briefly and just I examine what's going on for you. You know, why did the, the thought come up? I need to, I need to smoke or, you know, this behavior would really feel good right now. I wanted to ask a question, which is what was the reason for the name of the title? Where did that come from? And does it have anything to do with the Buddhist wheel of samsara? That's my yes, question. I think it absolutely does. Well, yeah, well spotted. Wow. It, it, um, yeah, that's right. Uh, it is from... It, may, it might be Ayurvedic, but I, I think he mentioned... Well, I'm sorry, I'm sure you guys... You, you've read it much more recent than I have, so... Um, I'm just... I, you know what, I actually can't remember the exact context in which he referenced the Buddhist wheel, but it, that definitely rings a bell. Well, the... The... the, the, um, the yeah. The book jacket shows these uh, poor souls with uh, tiny mouths and enormous stomachs, and the, the idea is that um, they can never uh, feed themselves enough right. because, of, because of their small mouths, and so that's their torment. I actually have a great quote about that. I think this is probably, um, this, really, this quote really um, struck me, like it's such a powerful um, visual, so it, it's kind of what you're talking about, Dave. Um, at one point in the book he says, Addictions can never truly replace the life needs they temporarily displace. The false needs they serve, no matter how often they are gratified, cannot leave us fulfilled. The brain can never, as it were, feel that it has had enough, that it can relax and get on with other essential business. It's as if after a full meal you were left starving and had to immediately turn your efforts to procuring food again. Right. Wow. What does? That's, yeah. that's, sorry, I just wanted to say that's a great quote. It, is that mm. in the book? Will I yeah. find it there? Yeah, yeah that's from Brilliant. the and, and the realm of the hungry ghost, as far as I remember, is, is a description of some mythological, uh, I think, Hindu book, isn't it? That about the, these are effectively these ghosts who live like that that can never be satiated, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I think you were right, Tom. I think you're onto it. Okay. So the the wheel, the Buddhist wheel of samsara, for those who don't know, is um, a wheel. Um, assuming it goes clockwise, um, there's lots of information on this wheel. But basically, you've got at one point the heaven realm, which is all about you know beauty, beauty, ecstasy, and and pleasure. Mm -hmm. You've got the next one over, which is the realm of rage and conflict, which is to do with violence and envy and jealousy. Beyond that, you've got the realm of animals, um, which is to do with instincts that animals have and survival and self-preservation. After that, you've got the hell realm. So this is the opposite to heaven. And here you've got agony, terror and depression. So that's, you know, rock bottom, you could call it. Mm. Um, the next one on is the realm of frustrated craving. And this is to do with neediness, uh, addictions and compulsions that we have as human beings. And it, as far as I understand it, this is where people get stuck or a part mm. of them get stuck emotionally at this part of the wheel. They're not able to go on to the next one. And the next one is the human realm, uh, which is to do with having purpose, having aspiration, um, and having, poss you know, appreciating the possibilities that there are. And I think being stuck and not being able to move on to that realm, and the next one is the heaven realm and it goes around again. Right, I think right. that, I'd, I'd be very surprised if that wasn't the reason why uh, this is the, the name of the book. So uh, I, Yeah, I he does mention it in the beginning. It's, it's something, yeah. He does. Yeah. Fantastic, yeah. Because yeah. it sort yeah. of fits, the for the mythology fits his experience of what um, what it's like to actually be addicted and what his patients are, are like, and he 
you know, he does sort of describe them as being like hungry ghosts. Yeah. And it's very sad. The, the, and like the book is, is really moving in the way that he does describe the lives of, uh, of his patients because they're not, I mean, they're, some of them are really intelligent and really, uh, you know, very perceptive as well. And, um, but yeah, just like completely shattered lives. Yeah, I mean, that actually re leads us really nicely onto um, one of the last things that I, I wanted to talk about. Um, I'm open to talking about whatever else, any, um, anyone else, anything else that anyone else wants to... Ugh. I'll start that whole thing again. <laughs> um, I'm open to talking about anything else that um, you guys want to bring up, but um, just talking about that, moving from the, the realm of the hungry ghosts into the human realm, uh, I really liked his... This is how we sort this out chapter. This was actually one of my favorite parts of the book um, was the the chapter on compassionate curiosity and how it's not the cure for addiction is not cold turkey. It's not quitting per se. It's just being able to be compassionate towards yourself. Mm. And I mean, I, I guess that was one of those things that I knew deep down already and that I have definitely experienced myself. But as I was reading it, it just really consciously struck me that, yeah, I think this is this is so true. And it, it just really highlighted how misguided um, our socially our, and culturally our approach to addiction is um, and how it's not about rehabilitation programs. It's not about... Um, you know, getting people through withdrawal. It's not about that. It's about encouraging people to foster a sense of compassionate curiosity towards themselves. Mm. It, it, one other, may I make a quick point? Yeah, okay. sure. I uh, completely agree with what you just said. And there were some chapters in the book that I don't think we've discussed and maybe, and it's fine. I was just thinking it's because you felt that at, at the very beginning, you mentioned that some of the more technical chapters, you didn't get as much out of them as you did the anecdotes and the, the personal stories. But one thing I did get, and, and I agree with you that they were a bit um, difficult to slog through. Um, one thing I did get from his stories about, uh, I don't know if you recall the rat park experiments, mm -hmm. And um, his chapter on gene studies, um, doctors uh, set up an experiment and they create conditions and then observe animals and their relationship to addictive substances, never stepping back from the situation and saying, well, maybe these animals are driven to taking these substances as a coping mechanism because they're in these little awful cages that are nothing like their their natural environment. But they're, they're separated at birth from their from their birth mother. And, you know, what would happen if they just led as happy a life as we could provide for them? And so the rat park studies came up and they found that in under no circumstances were rats uh, taking that particular, I, I, was it morphine or I can't recall what they were trying to addict them to. But when they were, when they were nurtured, um, as pups and then had, you know, whatever the idyllic setting for a rat is, this enormous space to run around in and, you know, fresh air and all that, that they just led normal lives and did not venture towards the, uh, the addictive, um, ingredients that they were trying to ply them with. So I, that idea that to look at a study almost like from a, a meta point of view where you step back and say, okay, before we accept these results as valid, what did we do to the animals in order to achieve these results? And mm -hmm. if the answer is, you know, basically inhumane, then that, that skews the results. Mm -hmm. Just anyway, I thought, yeah. I thought that was important. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up because I, sure. I do think that was really important. Also, what I, I mean, another thing that I this just brings it to mind. Another thing that I really appreciated about that section was that he really showed that there is so much proof um, from these studies um, that people, if you le if you decriminalize drugs, people, more people aren't going to get addicted to them. It's not about the substances themselves, as you were saying, Dave. You know, the rats would do anything to avoid. Um, I can't remember myself what the substance was. It was something like morphine or some kind of really addictive opiate. Um, but they just weren't interested in it. And 
I really like the fact that he made the point that there is so much scientific proof out there through these studies and numerous studies that have been done on this um, that it's not just the case that everybody is going to get addicted to drugs um, or everybody's going to be taking drugs if they are decriminalized because the vast majority of people just don't, you know, if, if the studies on animals are anything to go by anyway, are just not interested in it. And for people um, who are listening to the podcast, and Tom also, if you're um, going to read it, like we haven't really gone through and talked a lot about it, but just to say um, there are a lot of chapters and information about epigenetics mm. and about the problem of the question of genetic predisposition to addiction. And he really goes through and talks about the interplay between genes and environment and how environmental factors can actually influence uh, the triggering of different uh, of uh, uh, sort of gene effects and um, so-called epigenetics and he also talks about uh, he's got like a lengthy appendix about the problem with a lot of the studies looking at uh, genetic influences on addiction and the problem with twin studies in particular so if you're interested in that kind of thing there's there's a lot of it about uh, there's a lot about that in this book that you can um that you can find yeah, and I, I really recommend those sections as well because although I did say at the beginning that I I found them a little bit harder to get through, I think um, there is still, you know, they are really, I think anyway, a really definitive resource and we've read loads of books now mm. um, as part of this book club and I think they are a really, really definitive resource on those kinds of studies, the twin studies and the adoption studies and how they're not a reliable indicator of genetic inheritance and the nature they, they can't reliably be used as part of the nature versus nurture debate yeah um and that time and time again all these studies have come out on the side of nurture i just wanted to um uh say one more thing about the book um which i thought was kind of interesting and that was his um discussion about aa and aa type programs I thought it was kind of interesting because he has sort of a broad, I would say broadly positive view of AA as being helpful um, in his experience with his patients. Uh, he also says that it's not for him and that he didn't do that. Um, he doesn't really go into a lot of detail as to, to why he didn't do it. But I, I'm kind of suspicious of AA programs partly because of reading uh, the book uh, Games People Play by Eric Byrne. And Eric Byrne was very critical of AA um, on the grounds essentially of saying that it's a psychological game mm. um, and in the context of this sort of discussion I think translating that I think what Eric Byrne would probably be saying in the realm of addiction is that AA is a bit like replacing one type of behavioral addiction with another um, Matthew makes it, that point as well that some people can replace their addiction with he, an addiction to he, AA. Yeah, he does make that point, um, and I think it's probably a nuanced thing because, if, especially if you're really, uh, you know, if you're one of Gabo Mate's patients and you're like really addicted to um, crystal meth or something, then in a sense you could say, well, it's it's actually quite a step up to be addicted to going to meetings. You know, that's actually probably a lot healthier for you and a lot. You could probably get a lot more quality of life out of it. But I think some of the stuff to do with giving yourself up to a higher power and, and and that being a religious thing in whatever way you choose to understand that and stuff. I've always found those that that kind of thing... I mean, I don't have any experience of AA and I don't know anyone who's been in it, but I guess I'm a little bit a little bit sceptical of it. And um, so I just wanted to say, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what I made of that whole aspect of, of the process of helping um, addicted people. Mm. I don't. Th I'm not saying it's a bad thing because I don't really know enough about it. I'm saying I'm. I feel a bit sceptical about AA. Before we wrap up, I just wanted to talk, um, as I said, more about the, the. Uh, if you if you guys don't mind, I just wanted to read out a quote from one of the final chapters and talk about the four steps that he mentions because I. This is definitely. I mean, I enjoyed all of the book, but this is definitely the part that I got the most out of, and I I think is probably. Um, in my rank opinion, is the most valuable part of the book as well in terms of what to act, what you can actionably do if you can identify with um, having addictions in your own life, however they manifest, 
Um, so I, I just wanted to read this quote out to start with about compassion, compassionate curiosity and why it's so important. So he says, compassionate curiosity directed towards the self leads to the truth of things. Once I see my anxiety and recognize it for what it is, the need to escape dwindles. It is clear to me that the sense of threat and fear of abandonment that make up the anxiety were, in my case, programmed in the Budapest ghetto in 1944. Why attempt to escape some old brain pattern laid down when I was a frightened infant during a terrible time in history? It's there, and the circuits in which its wordless stories are embedded are indelibly a part of my brain. It doesn't need to go away. Indeed, it won't go away, not completely. But I can transform my relationship to it, become more intimately related to it. I can even gain some mastery over it, which means noticing it without allowing it to control my moods or behaviours. Similarly, I don't have to take on the impossible task of erasing the addictive impulses that arose from early acquired brain patterns, but I can transform my relationship to them as well. Essential to any such transformations is a letting go of judgment and self-condemnation. I want to share that just because I, you know, he, he writes a lot in the book about how addictions arise because of a physiological change in our brains that occurs when we are younger. I end up back Changes are there. And I was reading that thinking, oh shit, you know, <laughs> like I'm this, screwed. this is it for life now, baby. <laughs> but reading that, I felt such a sense of relief and it really reframed the way that I had definitely thought about addiction as well. Um, and kind of shed some light on my, on my own experiences with it and really highlighted just how skewed uh, social approaches to quote curing addiction are the fact that we need to quote cure it in the first place when actually it's just more about self-awareness and self-knowledge and the fact that you can't necessarily change your your physical makeup as an adult but you can learn to live with it and learn how to best manage it for you and I, I really I just felt so liberated reading that and I really really appreciated that mm. So I wanted to share that. And I also wanted to share the four steps that he talks about, just because, again, I really appreciated the um, the actionable nature of these. So these are, well, they're actually five steps because he added a step on for himself. But he talks about these four steps as being steps that have kind of been, I think, piloted in various university programs for helping people manage with their ADHD, addictions. ADHD, wasn't it? And he says, ADHD, yeah. And he said, it was for something else, but he says it's actually really useful for addiction. Yeah, and he said that it's what he used for his own, to, to come to terms with his own addictions as well, and his own addictive behaviour. So these are the four steps that he talks about. Number one is relabel. Um, so instead of, when you're in the high, when you're in the moment and you're thinking, you know, I need to eat five donuts right now, um, and you have that really insistent, urgent thought of, you know, I, I must have five donuts, it has to be five, it has to be donuts right now. Um, he says relabel it. So think of it like, I don't need to do this now. I'm having an obsessive, urgent thought that I have this need. So when you do that, you're kind of taking a step back and you're not mistaking a need for reality. Right. And I thought that was really, really interesting. It kind of connects to the mindfulness stuff that we were talking about earlier. Um, and it reminds me of the way that um, in mindfulness you, you deal with challenging emotions as well when you're kind of feeling really flooded and overwhelmed is um, taking a step back and saying I notice that I'm feeling really angry right now so instead of yelling at someone or you know punching something or <laughs> whatever you would do that is is not a very healthy way of expressing your anger just taking a step back and kind of you know, giving yourself a bit of a mental hug and saying, I notice I'm feeling really angry right now. It's the same with this. It's, you know, I notice that I'm having this obsessive thought right now. And step two is re-attribute, uh, which he summarizes blaming the brain. So this thought might look like, this is my brain sending me a false message. And he says, it's not about you as a person. It's not a moral failure or a character weakness. It's just the way your brain is firing. Mm. So you can still take responsibility for it, but without kind of blaming or shaming yourself. And I really like that. Step number three is refocus. So do something else healthy and creative for 15 minutes. And he puts a lot of emphasis on creative acts, uh, like writing or you, art or whatever. But he says creativity is a really, um, having a creative, healthy creative outlet is a really good way of distracting yourself from whatever addictive behavior you're sort of grappling with at that time. 
Step four is revalue. So remind yourself of the negative impact and effect that addiction has had on your life. Um, it's the kind of, I guess, motivation. And then this was his step um, from his own personal experience. But number five, recreate. What, so visualize what is the life that you want to engage in and create. Um, yeah, so I, I just loved those steps. I really, really appreciated the balance between taking responsibility for your actions and being 100% responsible for your behavior and the outcome of your addictive urges. Um, but also having compassion and caring for yourself. It just feels like it's, it's out of everything that I've read or heard about to do with addiction, it's probably the most self-caring and compassionate way of dealing with it that I've heard about. So I really wanted to share that. I think that's great. Thanks so much for sharing that. And I wanted to just, um, my last comment is I just wanted to say, um, he talks about a quote by Viktor Frankl, which I, I really like, um, which um, he, he mentions. And the quote is, um, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. And I really like that mm. quote. And I think that's a very uh, good, good way of uh, summarizing what it is that those steps are, are, are trying to help one achieve. Absolutely. And the whole book as well on the fact that it's, you know, in this debate whether between whether addiction is a disease or a choice, there is a grey area in between where it does change the way that your brain fires, but you still have a choice as to what you do with that yeah, and how you respond to that. So it's, it's a great mix of um, empowering and compassionate. Thank you. Okay. Did anyone have anything else that they? Um, I know you haven't read the book, Tom, but if you know, obviously, if you have any more questions or comments, please feel free. Or Dave, if you have anything else that you want to say before we wrap up. Well, no, thank you. I, again, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt, Tom. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I appreciate uh, everyone's time. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking part. I really, I really appreciate that link in particular, and I, I really mm -hmm. appreciate your contributions. It's great talking to you. Um, it's been really, really useful for me. So, so cheers. Great. Well, I'm, I'm so glad that everyone enjoyed it because I, I really enjoyed it. And thank you so much all for taking part and for, um, yeah, for creating such a great environment to chat in. Cool. Thanks, okay. everyone. So um, I just want to say before we go quickly, the next book uh, is on the 8th of September, which feels like a long way away, but it's not. <laughs> um, and this is How Will You Measure Your Life by Clayton Christensen. So going in a slightly different direction next time. I'm looking forward to that one. Yeah, I'm, I'm really intrigued to measure, uh, to measure this book. <laughs> <laughs> I was just reading the word measure. Um, I'm really intrigued to read this book and to measure my life. Um, so, yeah, I'm, uh, please join us for that. That's going to be on the 8th of September, same time, same place. So hopefully you can all make that, and I look forward to seeing you then. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Becoming Who You Are podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes and leave a review. You can get in touch with Hannah by emailing H-A-N-N-A-H at becomingwhoyouare.net. Don't forget to visit becomingwhoyouare.net and find out how you can use rational personal development to live an authentic life.